Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
lesson on her hope with gentle persuasion whispers a comforting word wait till the darkness is over wait till the tempest is done hope for the sunshine tomorrow after the shower is gone after the shower Steadfast rends the dark veil for the soul Whither the master has entered Robbing the grave of its gold Come, then, oh, come, glad fruition Come to my sad, weary heart Come, oh, thou blessed hope of glory This was not my idea, but I liked it. And so I'm gonna go with it. Here are our announcements this morning, presented in chronological order. On March 14th, that's this Thursday, we're gonna start our next community conversation series. This one's gonna be hosted by Jeff Chu, our teacher in residence. It is online, it's, you don't, it's, it's free. You don't have to pay for it, it's online, it's a series of conversations. It's free, 
Um, for more information, including what I forgot to say already, which is that the topic is the internet and social media. We're just doing it just in case there's anything in that topic that's worth discussing. For more information and to register, visit crosspoint.org slash events. Crosspoint.org Crosspoint.org slash events. We also have a couple dozen middle school and high school students working really hard to raise quite a bit of money per student to go on summer mission trips. So this Saturday, March 16th, these students, along with their adult leaders and family ministries, will be hosting a parents' night out. Are you a parent? Are you a parent or a guardian of a kid elementary age? Do you have a toddler in your house? Do you need a night out? Do you know a parent of a toddler who might need a night out? And you want to pay for them to have a night out while their toddler has a safe and fun time with our awesome family ministry staff and student volunteers while also helping these students go on a serving, bonding, affirming, challenging road trip to visit and serve a community elsewhere in our country. Well, if you want to do those things, then have I got news for you. Kids ages two years through fifth grade are welcome. They'll have a great time. And uh, they'll have a great time guaranteed. Or your money will still support a student doing good things. For all this and more, for all this and more, crosspoint.org. Also this Saturday, the 16th, Habitat for Humanity of Wake County. We, at, you may not know, we're in an interfaith alliance um, as part of the Habitat for Humanity of Wake County. And we are, this summer, we are building two houses. We're helping to build two houses, Cross Point, along with the other faiths um, that are involved, like uh, Baptists, like Sikh. You can mix some concrete with a Sikh. I don't know if that in particular, but you can break for lunch with a Buddhist, maybe, if a Buddhist is there that day. I can't promise these particulars, of course, but this is a good thing we're part of. Yesterday, uh, a crew started, I think, I think the foundation was already done. They were building walls yesterday. So you're gonna build more onto what they did. And it, you can learn a lot about, seriously, your own faith when you mix with someone, and especially when you're welcomed by someone in a different faith. That's my thoughts. For all this and more, all this and more, crosspoint.org. Easter, um, we are having it. It's my Easter sound. We're, ha we're, we're having it March 31st this year. Online service will be right here on YouTube at 10 a.m. like every week. And our in-person gatherings at the West Cary YMCA in Cary. You can find the address. Yeah. For all this and more To help you find From your way from uh, your home to ours, crosspoint.org. Yep, these two Easter gatherings will be at 9 and 11 a.m. on Easter Sunday morning. The services are identical. We just are expecting more people than usual because of the various reasons that different folks have for wanting to attend church on Easter Sunday. So what we try to do is get as many folks as possible to make reservations. Now there's no actual tickets. It just gives us a count so we can make sure there's enough seats for everybody. So please RSVP going to crosspoint.org Easter. Oh, that one's
it's Easter. For all this and more, crosspoint.org. We're thankful that Jesus came. For all this and more. Crosspoint.org. One more thing, offering. Um, as always, if you want to help fund our collective efforts as the Crosspoint community, you can find all the ways to do so at crosspoint.org slash contribute, or you can text Crosspoint NC to 77977. Bye. There's laundry to do and a genocide to stop. I have to eat better and also avoid a plague. My rent went up $150. I'll need to pick up more shifts. 20 people died in Rafa this morning and every major news outlet is stretching the limits of passive voice to suggest whole families may have leaped up through the air at missiles that otherwise had the right of way. I just got a notification that my student loan payments are starting up again, and my phone isn't charged. My cousin got COVID for a fourth time and can no longer work or walk or even feed himself. The person across from me on the L train seems to fashion themselves a punk rock revolutionary, but they're not wearing a face mask. And that's the kind of cognitive dissonance that makes me want to steal batteries. Fascists keep winning primaries for both parties, and I think I gained a few pounds. The CDC just announced that there are no more speed limits on highways, and I think this Ativan is finally hitting. The NYPD farmer's market only sells bad apples. Have you heard that one? Listen, it's warm today. Too warm for March, but I don't have time to think through the implications because there's laundry to do and a genocide to stop. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the fear? Can we learn to see the need? Can we share humanity? Well, I can see another day come. Broken people, we can be made whole. We can be made whole. We can be made whole. As we lay down our weapons, open up our hearts. Love is breaking us. Love remaking us. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the hate? Can we see another way? Forgive as you forgave. Well, I can see another day come. Broken people, we can be made whole. We can be made whole. We can be made whole. As we lay down our weapons, open up our hearts. Love is breaking us. Love remaking us. Broken people, we can be made whole. We can
can be made whole, we can be made whole. As we lay down our weapons, open up our hearts, love is breaking us, love remaking us. Come heal now, take away the blindness. we are meant to see we feel light devastating darkness oh I can see another day come I can see another day come broken people can we be made whole can we be made whole can we be made whole broken people we can be made whole we can be made whole we can be made whole as we lay down our weapons Open up our hearts, love is breaking us, love remaking us. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above? As we draw near to Easter Sunday, there's always this theological and emotional undercurrent about Jesus dying, why he had to, and for who, for whom. Uh, and I can't cover all of those lofty considerations about what Jesus' uh, death and resurrection mean. We do that in other contexts all the time. Today, I want to get at one of the other main ideas baked into it that affects all of us. Uh, it's the fear of God. In the New Testament, Peter plays a lead role as sort of the team captain for the apostles. And what's been most interesting about Peter for me for a long time is the role that he plays. He's always wrong. He's portrayed that way, almost comedically, and every action that he takes is, is wrong to some degree. His, his instincts and his impulses are, are sort of this what not to do of the Gospels. I mean, he tries to cut a guy's head off for Jesus. He tells hungry kids to get lost for Jesus. He, offers to shut down somebody else's movement because they're not on our team, even though they're doing great. Um, he, he talks so much at one point, God has to speak from heaven and say, shh, just listen. He tells Jesus he's wrong about what winning looks like for Messiahs. He's wrong, 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 wrong. The first time Peter meets Jesus though, he's just finished a night uh, fishing with his crew. They didn't catch anything. Sees Jesus that morning. Jesus says, let's go back out. And they catch this huge uh, net of fish. Uh, coming up empty all night long. And now they've got this huge, this is a miracle. This is a, probably an answer to prayer. And Luke 5 says, when Simon Peter saw the fish, he fell down at Jesus's knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Like I can't survive in your presence, that kind of thing. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. Isn't it interesting? We think this is the one thing Peter got right. Terror. <laughs> so I, I'd like to suggest so I'm gonna. Peter was wrong about this too. He's wrong about everything. He's wrong about this too. And one way to tell is Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. If being afraid is right, why tell him to stop? Just let him sit in this holy, reverent trembling that the, that the moment calls for. And he says, no, don't do it. I mean, it's just like the Adam and Eve story. They only become afraid of God and hide after everything goes wrong. Peter's wrong. He's applying his errors to the, to the situation. But somehow, you and I grew up learning, no, nah, he nailed that. You're supposed to feel fear in the presence of God. And this, what, this is what God wants. It's what keeps everything running the way God intended. So today, I want to talk about the fear of God. And I want to do it for several reasons. And one is many of us were told the fearing God is correct. It's, and there's plenty of Bible verses to support that. In fact, some of us can't, we can't conceive of faith without there being fear in it. 
and we, we phrase it, we, we know what's healthy fear is reverence. And I get that. And I'll touch on some of that maybe. But a lot of us have also essentially rejected the faith for the same reason of the, 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 the fear, the seeming centrality of fear. So part of us are still part of the faith because of fear. And some of us don't want anything to do with it because of fear. And then there's this complex chowder of reasons that I, I also want to talk about this that pertains to Christians in this country and Christians in other countries and, and, and Christians justifying bombing other countries and, you know, people who will vote at the expense of other people's liberty and happiness and, and freedom and their family members who can't be in the same room with other family members, people who can't listen to other people's reasoning or perspectives on complicated issues. Almost all of that, almost every time, has something about the fear of God in there behind it all. And so I can't get to everything, but I think I can touch on this in a way that'll be helpful. And I'll say from the outset, in several places, people fearing God is prescribed and celebrated in the Bible. I, of course, I know that. I'll get to some of that. The Bible has lots of things in it. It seems like at its core, we think being afraid, regardless of what we think the Bible says or doesn't say, we think being afraid of God is good and right because we think that fear is what we rightfully pay whatever has the power and the control. And can, whatever has that power and control that can use against us or for us, that's what we owe. And if you don't believe me, think of the bully back in school. How did they establish themselves in your young consciousness? It was that they threatened your body and your reputation. They made you feel like you were in bodily or relational danger if you didn't give them what they demanded. They made people afraid because young people, kids, because power for young and immature minds is about inflicting fear of harm and in trade you get some uh, sense of control. And that, uh, this is how the animal kingdom runs, fear of harm. If you do something I don't like, I'm going to hurt you, I'm gonna bite you or scratch you. And ideally, I'll do it in front of others so that I can debit your account publicly and add that to my account. But also, if you act how I want, well, I won't hurt you. In fact, I'll protect you from anybody else. Now think for a second about how many millions of clear thinking adults there are on the planet right now that think, and with just a few variations, this is what they think the gospel is, that God has decreed, if you do what I want, if you say and act how I want, I won't hurt you forever. And I won't let anything happen to you. This is not inspired. That's, that's the animal kingdom. This is the way of gorillas and lions and chickens. That's how they establish power and dominance. It's an anxiety system. But it works for humans too. Humans often act the same way. I mean, if you break a law, it's very likely somebody on behalf of the government, after there's, there's several seemingly more highbrow, sophisticated things that they'll try to do, but at the end of all of it, they're going to put their hands on you. They're going to neutralize and, if necessary, hurt your body and then put that body in a cage to strip your body of its control. And it doesn't have to be a law in that sense. I mean, there are other laws too, lowercase l. Stare at a man too long in a bar and you will be communicating to him that you're not afraid of him and he wants to be feared because whoever is feared has power and he will come over and threaten to hurt your body for staring at him, for the crime of aiming your pupils at him. It's a very similar mechanism, by the way, for reputations. If somebody can hurt your social or economic standing without doing anything directly to your body, they get the same sort of fear. I mean, how often do we see grown adults kiss the ring of some politician? Because if they don't, they're gonna miss out on some reward or they're going to find themselves cast out of the in-group with all of its benefits. Now, here's what's funny. No matter who we think of, if somebody requires fear, if it requires that we dread consequences, and that's how we signal that we're, that we're in, we're committed, we, we adore you, we're going to be obedient uh, and, and committed to what you're trying to accomplish, anybody we think of that demands that, it gives us a sense of revulsion, unless it's God. God, the epitome and zenith of goodness and wisdom and love, well, that's different. God's a good mob boss, right? All the others who expect fear, uh, they're bullies with unmet emotional needs. But God, I mean, being afraid of our cosmic parent, that's what it's meant to be good people since, you know, forever. So I'm suggesting that what makes Peter see divine blessing, all those fish, and assume, well, the correct, correct reaction here is cowering in terror. That's, that's the same thing that has 10,000 pastors right now preaching until they're red-faced about divine wrath and the abject terror sinners should feel. It's, it's the same thing. It's the belief that power is measured by an ability to, ability to do harm. They believe God is powerful and powerful means harmful if not feared properly. 
like mindless cornered snakes or an abused dog. This is why we read Paul rightly, who definitely had a past when it came to trying to make people, force people, frighten people into certain behaviors, asserting righteousness through like the animal kingdom. Paul came to say, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and a sound mind. He's reminding his audience that we don't live in fear of power. Now we have power instead of fear, but that power is marked not by our ability to inflict, but by a healthy mind and love of one another in an often loveless world. The same Paul in another letter reminds his audience, don't you realize it's God's kindness that's meant to lead you to repentance? God's not a bully. It's his kindness that's changing how we think and act. It made a disciple named John write, whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love uh, drives out, casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with trying to avoid consequences. And whoever fears has not found completion in love. They've totally missed the point so far. Over and over, there's this sense that at first, being afraid of God, that's the only way we could think of to keep ourselves in order. How we're going to keep other people in order, unbelievers, our children, whatever. But Jesus comes along and teaches and inspires something else entirely, saying, no, no, it's kindness. Believe it or not, it's love. It's compassion, not fear. That's what's going to bring healing and wholeness and liberation. That's what's going to change the game. Now, Whenever we talk about this, um, uh, there's this, just a couple passages that come up, um, the, the, this what about. And I, I want to spend some time on one of the what abouts. Because you might be saying, well, Jesus did tell people that fearing God is appropriate. Well, because wasn't it Jesus himself who said, don't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, fear the one, God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Yes, it was. But what if I told you there's context that <laughs> you can't legitimately build a whole theology out of a single passage. That seems like that'd be good to know. Uh, So briefly, here is a few things that you might want to consider. One, uh, Jesus didn't say hell. The the word hell there in almost all English translations is super misleading. There is no place named hell in the Bible. But English translators, hundreds and hundreds of years later, they started putting the name of that place from a different tradition here, uh, where certain words in the Greek come up. Hell is from Norse mythology. Nobody in the Bible had ever heard of a place called hell. That was 700 years later before anybody used the word. So the word Jesus used that's being translated hell is Hinnom Valley. It's a real place you can find on Google Maps today, although I hope you'll wait till I'm done here. Uh, Gehenna is how you say it in the, in the original language. It means Valley of Hinnom. And it's a place that has Uh, By the time Jesus is saying this, it's firmly established in his audience's mind to be associated with curse and shame. Uh, Dying outside of the will and the family of God is is just bad news. It just makes people tremble when they hear it. And there's reasons for that, up to and including that the people of God tortured toddlers to to in the fire to other deities to get their needs met. They mistreated people that were vulnerable. They were violent. They were acting awful. And it happened in this region. So whatever picture we have, when we see the English word hell, fiery caves and horned and devils and pitchforks, the writers of the scriptures would be completely baffled by that. So when Jesus said Hinnom Valley, he's pointing to a place that references a context of despair and regret and shame. In a similar way, I suppose somebody could, for lack of a, a better example, you could point to Chernobyl and speak of what actually happened, but also allegorically, because what are the, the things that it brings up to talk about it? So that's a big point to consider in this phrase that comes up all the time, this text people reference all the time about fearing God. Jesus didn't say hell, and the word he said didn't conjure up images of hell like we would have. Um, I spoke at length about hell a couple years ago, uh, about hell specifically. So if you're interested and you want to learn more, uh, the July 18th message, 2021, uh, uh, from the Weapons and Balm series uh, might be helpful. Okay, so here's some more context about what Jesus just said. Before he says the part I quoted, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, I'm sending you disciples out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, these religious influencers, the God talkers, the, the people who will threaten to harm you for a lack of conformity. For they will hand you over to councils, put you in prison. They'll flog you, flog your body uh, in their synagogues, and you'll be dragged bodily before governors and kings because of me. Don't be afraid of them. Have no fear of them. 
for nothing is covered up that will be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, say it all. Tell it in the light. What you hear whispered, say it. Don't hold anything back. Proclaim it from the housetops. Don't change yourself for the message because you're scared of what they'll do to you. And then that's when he says this little rhetorical thing. Don't fear those who can kill your body but can't do anything else. Fear the one that can destroy both soul and body in Hanum Valley. Now, how often do we hear talk from coaches or motivators? They tell us, I know you're in pain. I know it's scary right now. It's going to be worth it. Don't stop. It's going to hurt much worse if you quit, if you bail. How many teams have been told in locker rooms, don't give in right now because you think this hurts. You think this is scary. It's going to be a lot worse when you see the other team holding the trophy or getting the victory parade, whatever it is. It's in this vein rather than a threat to the friends that he loved that Jesus' words function. Or frankly, it's a sickening ultimatum he's putting on these men because he knows they can't, they can't do this, I, I, much less me. Don't be scared of what these people are going to do to your body because God can kill you after he kills you. That's If we take that literally, I, nobody knows who Jesus is. This doesn't make sense, sense at all. It's something else. But if that's not compelling to you, consider what Jesus says right after. He says, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in Hanum Valley. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet none of them will fall to the ground apart from your father noticing. Even the hairs of your head are all counted. So don't be afraid. So he, first he says, do be afraid. And then he says, so don't be afraid. You're more valuable than birds. Jesus is saying something like, if you're going to live by a habit of being guided by fear, I'm telling you, don't be afraid of the ones uh, who can only affect your body. Fear the one who can, not who will, but who can do far more than that. But let's remember we're talking about the one who keeps a ledger of sparrow deaths. So your life is far too precious for God to think of you as disposable or as a punching bag forever for being the human that you are. So don't even actually be afraid of God. My friends, if you want to be afraid of God, I can't stop you. But I just want you to know love is trying to. Some of us are too afraid of God to not be afraid of God. It feels like we open ourselves up like a, you know, a vulnerability. We, we insist in the name of other Bible verses or tradition or other good reasons that maybe other pastors will yell when I'm not willing to yell and they might, I might lose a debate with them. I might have good reason to think of God as if you're going to take God seriously, you got to fear God. But we are eventually going to run headfirst into the problem of love. And it's going to, it's going to come bring all these other problems with it because Jesus said, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be anxious about anything who by fear and anxiety can add days to their lives. Nobody preserves themselves by worrying about themselves. This is a big deal. Don't be afraid. And then he said in the same Sermon on the Mount and other places, all the laws, the entire thrust of the Bible and the tradition of faith of God, it comes down to love of other. If fear of God and God's terrible consequences for our sins and errors and shortcomings and wrong conclusions and bad theology and poorly resisted temptations, if the fear of God's dangerous power, that's how we think about anchoring ourselves and staying on the, on the straight and narrow, how we tell other people why it's necessary that they convert, then we're not living in a way marked by love. Self-giving grace and the elevation of others, the decentering of me and the elevation of you that Jesus put on display. No, we're, we're living fixated on anxiety. It's a survival mode that we're stuck in. Survival mode in the background of everything that we're doing. Jesus said it all comes down to love of others, but if fear is the chief expression of our seriousness, then love of self is the best we can do. I mean, what man would be called generous for giving money to the person holding him at gunpoint? That's not generosity. It's not love. It's, it's self-preservation. What woman would we celebrate as being honest and trustworthy for testifying accurately under oath and threat of perjury? If we're to be people of Christ's kind of love, then the absolute worst thing God could have done is added an or else to the instructions, because then that adds pressure to fixate on ourselves. If you want somebody to mature into an other-centered centered being of peace, well, you can't attach mortal dread to it. You only add threat if behavior is all you care about, not a transformed heart. A religion that tries to use fear, even for good results, it still ends up being a fear and anxiety and shame movement because it's trying to manage what it's actually most concerned with. And so it ends up being a controlling force, an excluding force, an anxious and suspicious and conspiratorial force, a force preoccupied with precision and correction 
and you can't befriend anybody except for whoever agrees with us because everybody else is scary. Everybody else is risking touching one of the little motion sensors that sets off the terror of God's offended attention. Fear breeds fear and misery and self-preoccupation, not self-sacrificial love of others. So if love is the sum of the way of Jesus and the will of God, then fearing God and God's horrific consequences, those are, those are completely different religions. And this is key because the difference between people who are really becoming more just and loving and those who are becoming better able to argue about God's holy, you know, terribleness, well, it comes down to what we think God's trying to do. Not just what kind of God we, we're dealing with, but what God's trying to accomplish, compel us to behave so, so God can calm down or assist us in becoming who we really are. And here I know I'm presented with a little bit of a wrinkle because sometimes when we talk about fear being inappropriate, um, someone will say, but what about fear's usefulness in keeping people in line? And this, this is admitted, admittedly a compelling point for some people because some people need to be frightened into resisting their destructive impulses. Some people don't do terrible things, not for love, but out of fear of terrible things being done to them consequences, revenge, punishment, you know, the, the wrath of God. Many times, personally, the reason I don't drive faster down the highway and I want to, it's not because I'm worried about the safety of my human siblings. It's not out of love. Uh, I don't want to put anybody at extra risk. I, st I don't want a ticket. I'm scared of fines. That's my motivator a lot of times. Some people resist all kinds of terrible, wicked, evil behavior, and the sole motivator of their, uh, of their behavior is fear of personal consequences. God's going to get them. I mean, without fear, what stops some people from being freely terrible? It's a valid question. It's just not for people following Jesus, the way of love, the way of the Spirit. It's a valid concern for people who refuse to be inspired to the way of love, but can only be persuaded by personal cost. And so at the risk of sounding a little self-righteous, if what you're doing is done out of self-preserving fear, I don't want to break the rules, well, you're not necessarily a good person. No matter the good results, you're an afraid person. And I refuse to believe or teach that Jesus came to show us how to be afraid actors, the proper way to avoid torture and by pretending in words and actions to be obedient, good people when we're actually anxious, terrified animals. And frankly, those controlled by fear are still likely to misbehave. We know that. They'll still do it. They just get better at hiding it. Jesus was, you might remember, the first person to use the word hypocrite the way we do. A hypocrite is a theater actor, which means on the outside they look one way, but on the inside there's something else happening. They're pretending. And those Christians who insist that there has to be fear and hell in the equation of faith, they say that if there's no hell or fear of divine wrath, then people are going to do whatever they want. Correct. Anytime somebody says that to you, just tell them you're telling on yourself. You're admitting the reason you're not more selfish and destructive and evil and giving in to using other people to satisfy your appetites. It's not about love of neighbor. You're just chained down by hell's pain. That's not Jesus following. That's hell management. Two totally different traditions, although they do share a vocabulary. And importantly, one more point on this, because fear doesn't just make people avoid evil. It makes them avoid good. Countless people, if they work up the courage to admit it, they say that they would like to you know, do or become the dreams that they would like to chase, uh, demeaning, smothering, abusive relationships they wish they could end, thoughts and feelings they wish they could just express and share, boundaries they wish they could make, you know, lines they wish they could draw, ambitions, when they think of it, it makes their heart beat so fast, things they wish they could give themselves to, but they're scared. They're scared that such self-love and self-advocacy and such status quo disruption, that's going to wake up the dragon that we call God, and they'll have hell to pay. And so they stuff it down their whole life sometimes. They erase themselves for a Jesus who said, I came that you'd have life and have it abundantly. So once we understand love and life are not to be incentivized by fear for people of love, that the good news is not good by comparison to something unspeakably hor horrific, that there's no God that wants us to be afraid and is threatening to hurt us for foolish selfishness or, or desire to live outside of other people's demands. And, and once we realize any God that wants us to be afraid of him, but we have to be peaceful and loving and forgiving to each other, somebody made that up to control us. Once we see these things, it's weird. We, we don't feel relief at first. We don't feel like we're graduating into something more beautiful and inspired. We actually get a feeling that we're falling away from the faith completely. And that's where a lot of us are now. 
You'll hear terms like deconstructing or post-evangelical, ex-evangelical, lots of different terms. They're all ways of saying, I don't want to be part of something that needs me to be afraid, that, that leverages my shame, but I still want to be a part of a community that links arms on the spiritual journey of love and justice. I want to evolve with others and for myself. I want to participate in healing and reconciliation that all of us need so obviously. I just don't want any of the, the, the fear crap. So there's these difficulties then that remain about Christ. Like, is there room for me to be part of this? But I, without getting hung up on all the terrifying wrath, everybody tells me that that's what Jesus came to address. Like, what is Easter beyond a celebration of resurrection? Isn't it due to the terrifying wrath of God that needed Jesus to die in the first place? Like, what's the point of Jesus if he didn't die to satisfy the fearsome anger of a terrifying God? What's the gospel if there's nothing to fear apart from it? You may or may not be surprised to find Jesus didn't speak of his work this way. He didn't speak of the good news or the, his interests or intentions as, a, as an ultimatum, like this alternative to the terror of being trapped forever in a fiery subterranean torture cave. He was always telling people that even in the midst of the indecency and selfishness of controlling abusive religion and politics, no matter what else is going on, the kingdom of God is here and you can be liberated to experience that. You can represent its values of self-giving love. You, anybody can. Anybody can, and anybody's welcome. So when we require threat of torture and harm, to be, we, we, we say there has to be a fear component to the gospel, to Easter, to why we do good to our neighbors, or whatever it is, to following Jesus. It means we don't maybe understand yet following Jesus, where we allow him to teach us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, trying to remember, trustworthiness, self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. There's, there's no fear in the fruit of the Spirit. If it's so important, why didn't it make the list? And if we're, we get scared, though, that this is going to let sin off the hook, right? It's going to be a free-for-all. It's only because we still believe that love lacks the power to do what we think only threat of pain can do, because we're still living on instinct, the animal kingdom, rather than the inspiration of Christ. We don't keep talking about love as a church and love of self and neighbor and stranger and enemy because we're, you know, weak, because we're unserious, because we're not taking the Bible seriously, because we're a watered down gospel church, whatever the heck that is. We keep talking about love because it's difficult, because it's casting out fear that we're used to. It's a way that very few of us actually make a solid go of. It's a way we actually have to ask the Spirit to help us because being afraid and demanding other people join us in our fear, that doesn't take inspiration. That just, that comes natural. Our pets are doing that. And so as I wind this down, I want to point us to how we can interpret the fear of God as we find it in the Bible because it's in there. How do we, how do we think about it in light of a Christ that insists love is the way and it's casting out fear and don't fear God. You're worth more to God than birds are. Proverbs 31 it paints a picture of a woman that actually comes from the writer's mother, and she's talking of this iconic, iconic picture of a woman according to the values of that region about seven centuries before Jesus. And it's a poem. Each line starts with the next successive letter in Hebrew and uh, the, the alphabet. And so we keep in mind this is a piece of art that we're taking out of its context by translating it. And it's also culturally distinct in more ways than we could ever know. So I'm not reading this to you to tell you this is what a real woman looks like. Because frankly, any man that would look like this woman in Proverbs 31, I mean, he'd be a national treasure. Um, but I, I want to read it as a way of explaining how fear of God, how it can be understood, how it's helpful. So here's part of it. A woman of strength who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it's still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her female servants, for her employees. She considers a field and she buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp doesn't go out at night. She doesn't run out of oil. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor 
and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's helping in her community. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. This is some cultural reference to everybody in the house, the kids, they're well clothed, that she's not scared when it gets cold. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. He's got a good reputation. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She doesn't look forward with anxiety. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, or beauty is only skin deep, but a woman who, there it is, fears the Lord is to be praised. Why'd they have to put that in there? I mean, maybe, maybe you got other problems with it too. I, I, I'm sure, I think it would be an interesting discussion, the Proverbs 31 woman. But there it is, right there at the end. She fears the Lord. And I want to suggest that it's more of a statement about what she is not afraid of than what she is. This woman is not walking around taking responsibility for her home, for her obviously several businesses, for uh, others less fortunate in her community, uh, for how things go all around her, the way that she plans and prepares, and the wisdom of her speech. This woman doesn't do all of this in leading and serving and making and helping and blessing and enjoying her life because she's afraid of God. Who and what she is is built on fearing what God is going to do. That's not right. What God is going to do to her if she were any other way, that's not her motivator. She just doesn't preoccupy herself with what you think. She doesn't get hung up on your expectations. When it says she fears the Lord, it's telling you she isn't afraid of you. She isn't trying to get you to approve of her. She isn't twisting herself in a knot to be properly understood by you. She doesn't have all of these demands that you treat her a certain way. She, she doesn't demand to talk to the manager. <laughs> she, she isn't valuing herself based on whether you find her useful or attractive. And I'm speaking to men too in this. It isn't just women that, uh, that she's representing. I hope that's clear. She, she isn't looking to the future and feeling frozen with anxiety. She does what she can. She prepares. She's at peace. She isn't afraid of that. She's not afraid of you. She isn't trying to compete with you or win your games. She doesn't care for pe people based on what she thinks she's going to get out of it. She cares for people and doesn't care what people think, generally speaking. She isn't afraid of you and I. To say she fears the Lord, it's to say she, she only concerns herself with the way of justice and kindness and deep, peace-filled living. She's living in the way of love. Those who fear the Lord in this way of thinking about it, poetically, rhetorically, it's simply a statement that they don't live afraid of anything. She's not afraid of God. She's not afraid of anything. She's free. She doesn't feel threatened. She's free. It's a variation on what David sang in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who would, who would I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? They're free. They're not afraid. They're free. What if the fear of God describes somebody who recognizes that they seek only to be who God made them to be, underneath the pretense and underneath all the acting and all underneath, uh, underneath the, all the layers that our culture puts on us, the expectations that we actually lean into and try to satisfy? They seek to be more and more kind and generous in a world that says pretty openly, well, your kindness and generosity are going to cost you in our big game. That they're trying to become more and more forgiving and understanding in a world that says, well, you're a sucker. They're trying to be more and more elevating of others that get pushed out into our margins and less and less self-centered, self-elevating. What if, what if fearing God wasn't actually about fear, but it was about liberating ourselves from fear or recognizing we are liberated from fear?
that it's no longer a motivator. It's no longer a, a gate or a restrictor or a communal glue that we're liberated from it and into the way of love. My friends, may we have the courage to put down the anxious faith of our younger minds and a God that must be feared and to step into a far more inspired, far more challenging, uh, a, a, a space that far more requires we collaborate and support each other, step into a far more liberating way of love. And may we radiate such peace and love in our own lives that others find that we are also nothing to fear. Amen. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home 